Everyone, thank you so much for joining us. Um, we've got a very special webinar today. It's not our normal format of an interview and a slide deck. This is all about this panel of experts. And the focus is going from surviving to thriving and really accessing those growth levers that move the needle for law firms going from 2020 now into 2021, where we are getting a better grip, a handle on what are the things that really um, move us to a stronger bottom line, running that law practice efficiently, productively, professionally, and profitably. So um, I'm going to just introduce myself and then the other panelists here and uh, our, our panelists and co-moderator, Kristen, will actually lead the bulk of the discussion today. So you have a treat for you there. She's fantastic. So I'm Maddie Martin. I'm the head of growth and education for Smith AI. We are a 24-7 virtual receptionist service. We handle calls, chats, texts, and Facebook messages. And we do a lot more than answer. We will screen, schedule, take payments, make outbound calls, and follow up on those leads and clients who are looking to and need to hear from you promptly. Um, and we integrate with uh, Clio and LawPay. We work closely with GNGF and Law Clerk. So I'm excited to have this gang here with me today. Uh, let's start with Mark uh, and then we'll go to Rio, Amy and Kristen who will then take it over after her introduction. Awesome, thanks Maddie. Um, so I'm Mark Homer. I'm the uh, author of Online Law Practice Strategy, and I'm the CEO for the past 10 years of uh, Get Notice, Get Found, or GNGF. Uh, we're a law firm marketing agency and uh, clients all over U.S. and Canada. Wonderful. Wonderful. All right, Rio. Awesome. Hi, everybody. I'm Rio from Clio, and obviously I'm from Clio. I'm the Affinity Partnerships Manager, and so I get to work with all of Clio's fantastic partners, uh, Bar Association and Law Society partners we have across North America. And if you haven't heard of Clio before, we are the world's leader in practice management and legal CRM software. So we help you handle everything from intake to invoicing. And we also work very closely with all of these fabulous people here. Awesome. Thanks, Rio. Amy, you're up. Hi, I'm Amy Mann, and I'm the Director of Creative Services at LawPay. Um, LawPay is an online payment solution developed specifically for lawyers, giving you a super simple and secure way to accept client payments online. And like Maddie said, we, we integrate with her and uh, the, the, the team at Smith AI with Clio, and we work closely with everybody on this panel. So I'm super excited to be here. Thanks, Amy. All right, Kristen, take it away. All right, away we go. So hi everyone, I'm Kristen Tyler. I am one of the co-founders of Law Clerk. Um, if you've not heard of us, we're at lawclerk.legal. And in a nutshell, what we do is we help busy attorneys, mostly solos and small firms, connect with our incredible network of freelance lawyers for project-based work as you need help, project by project, or also on an ongoing subscription basis. So we've got a ton of resources there. Check it out if you have not visited us already. So as Maddie mentioned, I'm going to be your uh, entertainment director today for our program. And um, the reason that this lovely group has nominated me for that is because I'm the only attorney of the group. I am still, I have an active license. I'm a partner at a law firm in Las Vegas. Uh, my practice background is estate planning and probate. So shout out to all of my fellow estate planners and probate lawyers out there. Uh, but so I'm going to try to guide this conversation from the perspective of an, an attorney with the, the thought process being really wanting to dig into some tools and trends that we can be aware of and learn from as we go from this whole survival mode during the pandemic to hopefully thriving and building really successful law practices that help a lot of clients. So we're going to go through that flow today. And as everyone said, please, please drop questions in the chat. I will try to weave them in as we go. We want to answer those timely and we hope this is uh, really informative for you. So we're going to turn on the, the fire hose now and away we go. So first off, I want to start Mark with you. You know, Mark, it's no secret that we are coming out of a really challenging year for a lot of attorneys, a lot of law firms, a lot of people. And, you know, over the course of the year, last year, whenever we've talked, you and I, you've mentioned that um, marketing is even more critical during tough times. Can you tell us some more about that? There we go. My name's muted. Um, so one of the things uh, I, we always, you know, talk about it is when we have, you know, conversations with, um, you know, prospects or even clients. It's it's kind of like everybody always kind of questions that marketing budget, especially when things are good, right? Like in a rising tide, tide lifts all boat. Um, but what we always say is like, you know, it's when things go down um, is when the 
the people who are looking for legal services, which may be less or whatever, um, are going to go after like the people that are doing really well in the marketing um, are going to get the undo uh, the more, more of the, the clients there. Um, and this last year was a perfect example of that. Uh, we, in some of my slides, and, and Rio um, can go into a lot of this later, but some of my slides, um, I have a, the, from the Clio Legal Trends Report, um, the example of, of the law firms who in Q2 and then through the rest of 2020, just had this you know severe dip in new matters and revenue and everything, and that's kind of like the, you know the average law firm. Uh, and she, again, she can go into all the data that you know the reason why we really trust and, and rely on the uh, legal, clear legal trends report. Um, but we were curious, is like, well, how did that impact people that were actually marketing, right? So we've got a lot of clients, um, you know, like we're, we're you know in the industry, um, uh, have a lot of friends and stuff. So can we look at a, across data? and see like how people who were just marketing, um, and, and we used a, a bar of like about $12,000 a year. So not just doing a little dabbling, but you know, doing a, a decent level of marketing or more and said like, how, did, how were they impacted? And when we looked at 2019 versus 2020, um, and, and I have the slides in there too, you can kind of see the, the graph, but there is that dip. I mean, there is the drop in Q2, but what was interesting is that those who were marketing had more leads in 2020 than they had in 2019 for the same month, month over month. So, you know, it, it went to show that, you know, those who were marketing did get that, you know, larger amount of people that were looking for legal services, the people that were still out there saying, I need help. Um, you know, the ones who are on the top of Google or doing search and doing social media and stuff were, were getting an undue amount of, of, of leads versus the ones that obviously we saw really struggled last year. So Mark, you mentioned a couple of pieces of data there, and I know that you and your team are big uh, data junkies. You love to gather it, analyze it, and uh, I'm sure that you've probably, uh, you know, gathered some lessons learned from the data that you and your team have gathered over the last year. What are some of the big lessons that you've learned, and where there's remaining opportunities for law firms? All right. So we um, we did boil boil things down um, last year. Uh, well, we do this every year. Our team does it, but it's usually more kind of internal things we do and adjust for for our clients. But um, we we've, we've been looking at last year for you know what were some things that worked really well that we kind of pivoted and shifted for some clients, um, and then what are some of just the trends that we need to take advantage of uh, you know for our clients in marketing. One of the uh, big ones, uh, and we talked about this a little bit um, last year, was uh, that the way people are finding your law firm is just so much more fragmented than ever before. So uh, an example of that is um, social media, right? So we knew that last year, um, a lot of people were going to Facebook in that kind of like uh, lockdown time. I mean, Facebook saw this massive growth, you know, from a, a general marketing trend. Um, what we saw, interesting enough, is that Facebook doubled the amount of visitors to law firm uh, websites that we manage versus like the previous year. So the it wasn't that people were just going to Facebook or, you know, they were also then converting and going to law firm websites from Facebook, Facebook, Google My Business. I mean, there's just a, a whole host, you know, email marketing, right? Like that still works, right? The way people are finding your law firm is not just you're handing them a business card and they're typing in your URL, right? Those days are over. Um, you know, they're actually, you know, searching and they're searching in all kinds of ways. Um, they're interacting with friends and, and colleagues, maybe in social media and coming to you that way. So uh, you need to make sure, uh, you know, that the action item there, right, is make sure that you're really thinking um, kind of like multi-channel or omni-channel, um, you'll hear us use that term a lot in terms of your marketing. So, um, which I know kind of stinks because that I'm kind of saying more work, <laughs> um, but there are ways to, you know, find where you, you really um, excel um, in marketing. If you're doing a lot of content marketing, uh, if you're doing a blog, then maybe you can repurpose that blog in other places. If you're doing some maybe videos, you can take the video, create a blog, create an article, create social media posts, create an Instagram, you know, video post or something, right? You can do things with one piece of content, but that's a very important um, thing is to, to make sure you're leveraging that kind of omni-channel uh, because it, people aren't just going one place to find you anymore. So that that's, that's one of the big trends, yeah. That's fantastic. And I know, you know, I'm big on delegation and uh, always thinking about what's the best use of an attorney's time. And I think a lot of those examples you just threw out there, Mark, like they sound great to the attorney, but they also sound like, oh my gosh, what am I gonna have time to do that? I think that's where working with um, a trained professional to outsource that and get that talent level to help is just so important. But um, I know that you've also talked repeatedly about if there's one key piece of advice to give attorneys right now, it's to work on your Google My Business. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? 
Yeah. So, um, so the, the the other another trend is that you know we've been kind of coming out and using the term Google is your best referral partner. Um, so Google's a, a referral partner. I mean, if you look at again, I, I referenced the Clio Trends report from two years ago where they showed, you know, about half the amount of people are, are looking for uh, a lawyer go to uh, you know a friend or colleague, but then the other half don't and just search. You know, just go try to find it on their own, figure it out, right? And in that group, if that's 50%, a significant amount of them are probably finding you by going to Google. And so if you're ignoring Google, you're ignoring what is probably the biggest referral partner you have. And Google My Business is like the free website way to kind of like really like, you know, dominate and get a lot of uh, business from, from Google. Those who do it well, we've got clients who get over 50% of their calls just from the Google My Business. They, like people even make it to their website. They like clicked on the phone number right on the Google My Business map or something, right? And and so that like in the amount of people who still haven't claimed it or aren't optimizing it, um, it's just you know it's just sad because it's it's a great way to leverage it. I mean, I you know one of the tips and Maddie uh, you know can talk about this one too. But like I always say, you know, if you're using a call center that's 24 by seven, you can change your thing uh, to say you're open 24 seven. And then you're going to show up as open when at seven o'clock somebody call you know looks for a lawyer. Everybody else says closed, right? Like these little tips from Google My Business are are just awesome. For sure, you hit on another thing though that I've heard you um, talk about, and you have some really great advice in that. You know, a lot of lawyers have changed the way they're interacting with clients and the way they're running their business in this new virtual world. What are you? What's your best advice for how to market that to potential clients? Right. So the. Um, so, but one of the other trends that we do talk about, and I'm glad you brought this one up, is that you know, consumers are expecting, you know, like a, a digital uh, way to interact with uh, business services these days, where that CPA is doctors, and it includes lawyers, right? Um, so, so law firms who have made a massive shift this last year of adding payments, right, adding uh, you know back office systems and portals, um, having access, you know, all this technology that we've thrown into things. It actually is how clients clients want to work with you, right? Zoom calls, you know, instead of like driving down and parking, or maybe a spouse is here and at work and somebody else is at home. Instead of having to go to a meeting in an office, they can just jump on a Zoom call with, with the lawyer, right? So there's a, a lot of benefits to the client. What's happened though is like everybody did all this stuff, but nobody took the time to go to their website and say, "Hey, guess what, clients? I work the way you want to work." So my big recommendation is. All the data that you know, like Amy and Maddie and and, and you and uh, Rio will talk about in terms of like why digital services are so important to consumers. I'm just saying, from a marketing perspective, put that on your website, put that on, the, on your homepage that you do uh, have Zoom meetings, you accept uh, credit card payments or have payment plans or whatever you know, like the different models that you've you've introduced. Highlight that because that is how consumers want to uh, interact with a, a firm, and so many people aren't doing it that if you're the only one in your town who does, then guess who's going to get an overwhelming amount of business. That's right. Yeah, this is definitely one area where you want to toot your own horn and let people know what you're doing and why it's awesome. That's Absolutely. Great. So, Mark, you are clearly always a wealth of knowledge when it comes to growing a business, growing a law firm, marketing your services. If any of the viewers here want to know some more about uh, what you're doing at GNGF, what resources do you have available? Um, so one of the things, if you're interested in, you know, learning more about these type of topics, uh, I always throw people to our um, kind of YouTube channel and uh, we have a GNGF.tv is a very fast way to get there. It'll take you to a, a page where you can kind of jump off to Facebook or YouTube wherever you're comfortable and there's a ton of content there. Um, but also for those attending, I do have, um, uh, you know, so we have our book, uh, you know, 300 pages of great content. You can go on Amazon and buy that for $50. Or uh, we have an ebook version that if you just are cool with a PDF, um, you can go to gngf.com slash thrive. Um, and we can throw that in the chat too, but uh, you know, um, fill it out. And then uh, I talk about omni-channel marketing a lot. Um, if you want to see a really good uh, email sequence, I recommend you see, watch how we actually email you because that's how I would recommend a lawyer email, you know, like social, social proof, you know, give some testimonials, give some frequently asked questions and stuff. Um, so that email sequence, see how we email you once you download that book, um, you'll get some good tips that way too. It's gold, Mark. Everything that comes out of your mouth is just pure gold. I love it. So thank you so much for sharing your wisdom today. So, you know, Mark obviously has got a ton of great information about marketing and connecting with new clients. And the next phase to me as an attorney is I think about, okay, well, if I'm putting myself out there to connect with these new clients, how do I manage the next phase of the process, which is communicating with them, responding to them. And there's no better expert on that topic than Ms. Maddie Martin, who is our gracious host today. So Maddie, you know, the pandemic has caused disruption, so much disruption for everyone and for attorneys and small firms in particular. 
Um, what are some of the ways that you've seen attorneys mitigate some of these uh, challenges and these disruptions in terms of the client experience? Yeah, while well, the client experience is paramount, uh, if you've read the, the Clio book on that, it's, it's the most important thing. And, you know, what we see is even clients who don't move forward with a law firm potential leads, they're writing five-star reviews on Google uh, just because of the client experience, just because of that first phone call. So it's the most important thing that you can do for your existing business and then to attract new business. Now, there is a lot of pressure on being flexible and being available at all hours. We see a lot of disruption, not only on the attorney side, uh, but on the supporting staff side, on the paralegals, on the legal assistants, a, a lot of the partners and then staff attorneys who are there, small and medium firms, you know, they have a lot of demands and you know, you have to take care of your, your family, put your mask on first, right? So what we see is that there is a lot more pressure now to extend the hours, to be flexible on the ways that people can get in touch with you. And that puts pressure on the responsiveness. It puts pressure on what are the channels that you need to be aware of? You know, it used to be that you stand up a website, maybe you've got Google, now you have a recommendation engine on Facebook. You have a lot more channels. You have TikTok. Uh, you have messages coming from all which way, right? And then you have these marketing campaigns that are also you're infusing cash into to generate leads from. And you want to make sure that you're spending your money wisely. So getting the right systems up and running is absolutely critical. You want to make sure that you have a way to track and a way to account for every single communication channel. So if you look at um, you know, slide 22, slide 26 of the deck that I shared in the chat that we'll share with everyone after, um, you know, there are many ways that firms are getting contacted by these new leads. And the most important thing is that you have a well-documented process for the who, what, why, when, and how of responding to them. So who's going to respond? Are you aware? And you have, have you taken inventory of all the channels? Because what we saw last year, sort of while we were in survival mode, is how do we make sure that our phones are forwarded to our home line or our cell phone? Um, how do I make sure that when Smith AI answers and they want to transfer a call to me that it's getting transferred to the right place? How has my schedule changed? Am I taking calls later in the evening or on the weekends? Because that's a competitive advantage if it's a warm lead to accept that transfer on a Saturday at noon. People will do that. It's important though that the call comes through, that it lands on somebody because somebody is better than voicemail. It's better than the black hole of the contact form that never gets followed up. It's better than the email that doesn't have at least a response within an hour that says, we got it, we would like to move forward or we refer you out to this other firm. Um, that predictability also sets up a very good client experience that is the foundation for that new client who will be a relationship with your firm. So if you set the boundaries, if you set the expectations, if you steer that first conversation with the right content also, the right information to provide to help them make a great decision to move forward or not, then you're able to say, I've been guiding from the get-go. I have better client behavior. I set better boundaries on my time, but they know that when I say I will follow up, I will follow up or my team will. And that is a trust exercise that you can't start early enough in that communications process between the law firm and your clients. That's for sure. That's so true. So you've already touched on a number of ways that our behaviors have changed. And, you know, again, consumers and businesses both have made a lot of changes to the way they interact uh, in response to the pandemic. What are some of the key behavioral changes and expectations that, you know, attorneys serving both consumers and businesses should be mindful of? 
you know, look, we, we live in an instantaneous world. We can get a same day uh, package from Amazon. Maybe you have to wait one day now in the pandemic. Uh, you can get your groceries delivered and people expect that level of responsiveness. They also expect an informed response. So simply sort of the, you know, call centers of the, of the past decades ago don't cut it anymore. So what we've done at Smith AI is to say, look, we need to actually get work done on this call. Are we going to pass a warm lead, a warm transfer into um, the attorney at the firm? Have we pre-screened them first? Have we scheduled an appointment and taken a payment for a consultation often using a law pay invoice? Are we putting that information into the system so we cut down on the data entry time, right? Those are the best practices where you have the automated workflows supporting the talent that's on the front lines, that's on the consultation, that's working the case. So make sure that you are using that sort of human effort efficiently and that you're automating a lot of other things. Also that you're checking your system. So last year, a lot of systems were set up, as I mentioned, and how often do we go and audit and check on those systems and test them, not often enough. I will say that categorically. So if you haven't called your business number in a while, do so. If you haven't called your direct line in a while, do so. Make sure that every phone number that's out there for people to reach your firm is a quick connection, that there's not a long delay, and that also when you have a certain number of rings on sort of the caller side, it's the equal number of rings when you hear it on the recipient side. And, and what we see is sometimes there's major latency. And I have a slide um, on this in a great article from Corvum founder, uh, who is a sort of Clio integrated VoIP uh, uh, phone system. And there's this latency basically means that someone is waiting for the call to connect, but it sounds like it's ringing. It sounds like they're waiting for someone to pick up, but it's actually not connected yet. So you don't hear the rings on your end. And by the time you pick up, that person has already waited for six to eight rings, if you can believe it, and they're gone and you wonder why there's nothing on the other side. So that's something that we as a receptionist service can experience. Um, and it's really critical that you Make sure it's not happening with your phone system, because if it is, that article also has a great template for reaching out to the VoIP provider to ask them to look into your system and to fix it because it's not acceptable. The other thing that's really important is not just to be responsive, but to not let leads drop off because of lack of follow up. Mark touched on this. It's really critical to have an email drip and also outreach outbound calls, even text messages There's a very high response rate. You may think website chat, texting, it's not for you. You don't like it when the car salesman texts you after test driving a car, but guess what? They do it for a reason. It works. Um, and, and it's in your best interest to try those different techniques and channels and determine, does it work for you or not? before making an assumption that it can't possibly. So that's what we see. We see a lot more testing. We see a lot more follow-up, a lot more um, sort of iterative approaches to the marketing and to the nurturing of new potential clients. I, I just love all of these ideas that you have. I love the idea of calling into your own system and testing it out. That's a fantastic, very actual item that people can do today to make sure that things are- I hope you do. <laughs> Um, so, Maddie, you obviously work with a lot of attorneys and law firms all over the country, and you see those attorneys and firms that are still uh, thriving and seeing a lot of success. What are some things those successful attorneys are doing that could be replicated by some of our viewers today without like a giant learning curve? Yeah, I mean, well, the number one thing that the successful attorneys are doing is that they're not letting any lead wait for a response, and they are on top of every channel and they have clearly accounted for them. They're also documenting clearly the sort of repeatable questions that they can identify, get them the right leads, the right consultations that don't know show um, you know, every single week. So, so the most important thing is do you have a system for ask the questions, book the consultation, you know, have you taken payment? Does it go into Clio? Does it go into your system? And is there a workflow attached to that? Does it prompt that human to do the next thing? Does it prompt the system to do the next thing? 
setting those systems up is actually surprisingly easy. There's a lot of plug and play, drag and drop sort of situations where you don't have to be an engineer or a programmer to set those systems up. And if you work with the teams here, you know, that leverage the expertise that is absolutely a best practice that's so often overlooked, ask instead of telling more. Ask how do firms like me best get the most out of Smith AI, Clio, GMGF, LaPay, Locker, right? Like how are you getting the most out of the Google My Business profile? Maybe there are certain areas where you think you need um, to level up. And if you ask, what else am I missing? What else would be good for me to consider at this stage? You will get that response that really opens your eyes and has a major impact that won't draw down on your time. I would say also one of the creative things that we're seeing is a lot better sort of usage of the classic intake form. The more that you take that contact form on your website and turn it from name, email, phone number, big blank box to write your life story or nothing at all. And then you're wondering, do I follow up or oof, should I follow up? This is this seems like a, a bit intense, right? The the sort of best practice that I share a couple examples of on slides 31 and 32 are what are clever ways of giving value first and then following up as someone who, you know, sort of owes you one, right? Like if, if you just help someone fill out an eviction notice or you helped estimate sort of their traffic ticket or, or the cost of the DIY, right? I and mean, there's a lot of movement on the legal products, which you can also DIY as, as sort of lead generation. If you're giving something of value, if you're giving that calculator, then are you able to follow up and say, just want to check in about that legal issue you're working on yourself. Can I be of help? If they are going to hire any firm, it's going to be yours, right? You've already done them a solid and they owe you, even if they haven't logged that specific phrase in their brain, um, I would say get creative and deliver value first and you will find that just like with referral partners, making the first referral ends up getting you more referrals back. The golden rule really applies here. And that's something that transcends COVID completely. That's for sure. Amen to that. I love that. And there's, there's so much work out there. There's so many people that need help from attorneys and to be able to, like you said, lead by offering value is just um, the best way to go. Um, as an attorney, I hope that gives us a little better name out there sometimes. So, all right. Thank you, Maddie, so much. Um, I think I want to transition now. So we've talked about marketing strategies. We've talked about uh, making sure you're responsive and properly, you know, implementing systems to communicate with potential new clients. And so the next phase to me is kind of like, what can we do when we get all these new clients in the door to stay organized, to not miss deadlines, et cetera, et cetera. And obviously for most attorneys, that means turning to some sort of a practice management system. And we're lucky to have Rio here today from Clio uh, to share with us some insights and trends that her team is seeing. And, you know, one of my favorite things about Clio, uh, first off, full disclosure, it's what my firm uses as well, <laughs> uh, but I always look forward to their annual legal trends report. Uh, if you're not familiar with it, um, I would love for Rio, just if you would start out and please tell us about that legal trends report and specifically tell us how the 2020 legal trends was a little bit different than prior years. Yes, um, absolutely. I think we can all agree that 2020 was a bit of a different year all around for everyone. And the Legal Trends Report is certainly um, no different. So if you haven't heard of the Legal Trends Report, it is uh, the first longitudinal study of the legal industry that has ever been done. And so we at Clio have actually done this report for the last five years in a row. So we've spent, we spent a lot of time collecting data, collecting information and analyzing it, it's very important to us that we're able to provide actionable data insights for lawyers to be able to build thriving practices. And some of the ways that we do that actually is that we gather information from uh, our program from Clio. So all of this information is anonymized, it is aggregated, we never release metadata. And then we also conduct surveys with legal professionals across the United States and legal consumers. So that gives us a really good kind of rounded out idea of um, the different things that are happening in the legal industry and different, the way that people are starting to think about legal. And so last year, you know, as we know, it was a lot different, but one of 
perhaps the biggest shifts that we saw last year was the perception towards technology and how important that is in law firms and also for clients of law firms. So we saw a lot of lawyers being very concerned about the role that technology plays in their firm, whether or not they're even going to be able to run their legal practice in 2020 and beyond. Um, a number of about 47%, if you want to look at slide 48, were worried that they wouldn't even be able to make a living you know, with um, going forward into 2020. And it's kind of the same with consumers. There's a lot of, lot of uncertainty as well, but one major shift we saw was that a huge number, so 58% of consumers are actually more in tune with technology and technology is more important to them than it was prior to the pandemic. So I think that represents a really major opportunity for law firms to start pulling in some of these technological tools and introducing them to their clients and kind of enabling them to work with those tools as well. Absolutely. I mean, technology, if you weren't into it a year ago, you certainly can't <laughs> but help but be a bit of a tech junkie now. Um, yes. So, you know, your report for 2020, also one of the things that stuck out to me, as you've mentioned, was the attorneys who were using tech different pieces of technology did better than those who weren't. But, you know, what were those key technologies? What were those attorneys using that was helping them find that success? Yeah, absolutely. So the three key technologies that we observed making a huge impact in the revenue on a even per attorney basis in 2020 were client intake and legal CRM, so legal client relationship management programs, um, online payments, so obviously law pay, making it easy for people to pay, and then client portals. And ideally, these three technologies would work together. And we saw that firms that used all three of these actually made significantly higher gains than firms that were using, say, just one or two. Um, so it's, it's a major difference. And I mean, these are kind of game-changing technologies. And when you're thinking about you know, client intake and CRM, the programs like that make it totally possible to streamline your intake process, but also to improve your replies, right? Like, just like Maddie said, you know, to improve that response time is so, so key. And it also helps you be able to track, you know, where all of your leads are in the hiring process. And I mean, if you're going to be spending money advertising and, you know, investing in that and investing in leads in the door, you really have to have a way to manage those. I know I've heard Mark say this many times and I love it. You know, what if you got a thousand leads today? You know, what could you do with those? Would you have a system in place? Would you be able to handle those? And that's what client intake software allows you to do. And then when you're, we're shifting and talking about online payments, I mean, in, I believe it was 2020, less than 39% of Americans had more than $400 in their bank account. So if you think about that, most people cannot afford a major legal issue. And what that ends up is that people end up not getting the legal help they need. They end up not looking for lawyers. But if you are accepting online payments, that gives you the flexibility to allow those clients to pay you in the way that they're able to pay you. So whether that's a payment plan, you know, um, whether it's overtime or via credit card, however, however they're able to pay, you're providing them with flexibility, which means that even in times of difficulty, like this last year, you're still getting paid and you're still making money. And lastly, you know, with client portals, I mean, these are really key and essential because it cuts down on the amount of time that you have people calling in and asking for case updates. If you're able to provide secure case updates, share documents, have your, have your clients view invoices, all of these things together in one place. I mean, not only does that significantly improve your the client experience that you're delivering by creating this kind of transparency and giving your clients a window into what you're doing, but it also saves you so much time and helps you run a really efficient law firm when, you know, particularly if you're a smaller solo firm, you've got lots of other things going on and lots of other hats to be wearing. So, and then again, ideally, these things all work together to form just this kind of like super trifecta <laughs> of, of legal software. They do indeed. And it's, it's a little bit of legal tech magic. I love it. So yeah. in addition to these key features, you know, Clio also has a ton of different integrations that work to make lawyers' lives easier. And as an attorney, I'll say, when I hear the word integration, my brain goes complicated, don't check it out. But a lot of these are really easy to use and get set up. So don't mm -hmm rule out an integration just because it sounds complicated. Most of them are very straightforward. So um, in addition to some of the features you've already talked about, Rio, what are some other integrations and features that lawyers should consider implementing to thrive yeah. this year and beyond? 
Yeah, no, absolutely. And that's such a great question. I also, I love integrations, but I have to agree, you know, when sometimes when you hear that idea, that word, you're just like, wait, wait what do I have to do? But I mean, just as Kristen mentioned, it is so easy. We, we try to make it really simple. And some of the most essential ones this year, I think, you know, we've already talked about this, but Google my business. That's big. It's a huge one. It's something that you definitely need to be paying attention to. It integrates with Clio and it's where a lot of your leads and your potential clients are going to be coming from. Um, next will be like the Zoom integration. Very, very important. Um, how are you going to communicate with your clients if you know, you're not able to meet with them in person? Um, so Zoom is a really good one. And another one that I really love is Microsoft Teams. So particularly if you're working with a distributed team, that gives you a way to keep you all connected. It gives you the flexibility to be able to work together and collaborate um, you know, and kind of keep your momentum going and stay organized. And I mean, obviously, you know, law pay, Law Clerk, Smith AI, GNGF, these are all fantastic programs. And I think when you're thinking about integrations and which ones to use, which ones to look into, I think there's two really important things you should keep in mind. The first one is, is this solving a problem? Is this going to solve a problem for me, for my clients? Is this going to create more efficiencies? Is this going to be useful? Because it's so easy to see all the options and go, oh, oh my goodness, there's so many different features and different things out there and they're all really exciting. But before you know it, you'll end up with, you know, 20 subscriptions to things that you're just not using. So is it solving a problem? And the second one is, does it play well with your other programs that you're already using? So, you know, does it integrate with your practice management software? Does it integrate with your virtual receptionist? Does it have the option to work with your payment processor? Like, is it going to play well with others? Because otherwise that's just going to cause inefficiencies going to lead to mistakes when you're transferring data. And it's really just going to be a pain and one more thing that you're going to have to worry about. It's a great way to approach the tools and really uh, consider if they're working or not. That's awesome. So uh, Rio, I know that you guys have a ton of resources available for lawyers that want mm. to learn more about all of these topics. Where can attendees uh, go if they want to dig into this a bit more? Yes. So I'm going to direct you to kind of two different places. We've got uh, clio.com slash resources, which I'll throw in the chat. We have an extensive library of resources. We've got CLE webinars every month, meetups every month, um, on-demand webinars, white papers, blog posts. I mean, you name it, we kind of do it. We've got lots of things. And we also have the legal trends report. So you can access all of the Clio legal trends reports for free on our website. And I will post the link here definitely give them a read. Um, they're very, very interesting. There's a lot of fascinating information in there and really great insights that you can really leverage to kind of thrive in this new normal. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Rio. Thank you. Thanks. So moving on, we've talked about marketing. We've talked about intake and communications. We've talked about managing that workflow. But another really important piece is making sure you get paid. And that's where we're going to get some insight from our friend, Amy Mann from Law Park. So Amy, Talking about money and payments can be uncomfortable for some lawyers. They would just want to do the lawyering. They don't want to think about the money part. But what would be uh, your advice about how to approach this? Because it's a very important topic for lawyers. For sure, for sure. And there's really, there's no way around it. You know, billing and payments is, is the lifeblood of your practice. It's how we keep the lights on. It's, you know, how we help that next client and the client after that. And so, you know, coming from the payment space, the best recommendation I have is just, kind of bite the bullet and do it. Um, it's, it's, it can feel uncomfortable. It can feel gauche. It can feel icky if you know, you know, stuff going on in the client's personal life. And so as much as, as much as is possible, just kind of accept it for what it is, get a little zen about it. Be like, okay, now it's the time that I've got to do this thing that I previously haven't enjoyed doing. But the more you can build structure around the practice and the more you can um, kind of put parameters and some best practices in place, the less it will feel like this daunting thing that's perpetually hanging over your head like a black cloud and more just a prescriptive thing that's a part of your day. You know, I always joke about it kind of in the same terms as like starting a new gym routine, right? Like if you haven't been to the gym in a while, that first trip is just like, oh, I'm dreading it. I don't want to do it. But if you build habits, if you build it into your practice pretty soon, it's a thing that just, it's a normal part of your day. So, um, put structure into your practice of, of, of sending out bills and following up on unpaid invoices. Pick certain days of the month and those are the days that you do it. So it's not something that's sitting with you every single day. And the more you can kind of 
just treat it as a practice, treat it as a discipline, you'll find that it loses some of its edge and it just becomes another thing that you do on the days that you plan to do it. I think those are all really good advice. I know for me, I don't know why I dread having to take the time to sit and review my free bills and get them out the door, but obviously I have to do that to right. pay my staff and pay myself. Mm -hmm. um, so I usually um, hold a little carrot over my head, like, okay, if you get this done, you can go, you know, get Mexican for lunch, or you can go get a Starbucks or whatever. So I'm from, Texas. I'm from Texas. So I always uh, encourage using Mexican food as an incentive for just about anything. So yeah, yeah. send out Sorry. your bills. It's an enchilada day. I love that. Oh, like an ice cold Topo Chico. You like those too? Oh, I can't stop drinking them. The ones with the hint of lime, it's my jam. Good, good. Well, I also just have to chime in here too, that if you are really uncomfortable with some of the follow-up work that sometimes has to be done to collect on accounts receivable, you know, that's another great thing to delegate to a team member too. So mm -hmm. keep that in mind. But, you know, before you get to that, that point of chasing AR, hopefully maybe you've even considered some different um, payment plans and tools to make it easier for your clients to pay you. So Amy, what are some of the trends that you're seeing specifically in the legal space with payments to make it easier for clients to pay routinely? Absolutely. So before, even before, you know, 2020 happened and the pandemic hit, the trend in payments, in, and that includes in the legal space, was dramatically shifting in favor of the digital experience. You know, you think about most encounters that you have in the day, you think about, or, or when it comes to payments, you know, paying an electric bill, paying your Netflix bill, paying for something you're ordering on Amazon, all of these experiences are digital. And, and many of them are as simple as a one-click checkout or an, an automatic deposit um, or debit coming from, from your account. And so this is the system that most people have been, have been increasingly adopting over the last few years. And 2020 just turned up the dial on the speed of adoption for that. And so over the last year, everything has been going through a digital channel. And so in the legal space, we're really seeing that, um, that play out with tons and tons of clients, not just adopting online payments, but expecting that as an option when it comes to hiring a lawyer. I think one of the biggest trends that we're seeing specifically is, is the adoption and the preference for, for payment plans. So if you're looking at the slide deck that Maddie sent along um, on slide 66, you can see that 72% of consumers who were polled stated that they would prefer to pay their legal fees via a payment plan. That is the vast majority of clients out there. Um, but only 53% percent of firms were equipped to offer this solution. And so, you know, in the legal space, that's a huge differentiator. And that is a huge opportunity um, to meet clients where they're at and to offer them the services that they're specifically looking for and that they need um, to be able to retain legal services. Um, now, even looking back at this last year, that just goes through the roof, right? Um, one of the really interesting things that came out of the Clio Legal Trends Report, which Rio was talking about was, you know, a lot of lawyers expressing this fear that during the pandemic that clients would be unable to pay for legal services. Well, offering clients the options to pay via a payment plan is really a sophisticated opportunity to mitigate that fear, to extend the opportunity for justice to a much wider client base, um, and in the meantime, create a predictable revenue and cash flow stream for your own office. And so with payment plans, we've really seen it play out as just a win-win across the board. Um, not to mention from an effort and activity perspective, it's nothing for you, nothing for your client. Uh, those payments, you guys can agree on the terms of what your payment plan is going to look like up front, maybe during the client intake process or, you know, at, a diff at an additional meeting. And then it's a set it and forget it. So the client doesn't have to worry about it. You don't have to worry about it. They're able to afford legal services in, in increments that make sense with their budget and their resources. And you can predictably kind of forecast your cash flow because you know when that money's going to run automatically. So, like I said, across the board, win win for payment plans. And you can set those up within Clio. You can set those up directly within LawPay. It's it couldn't be easier to get get running for you and your client. I agree. It is. Um, I've admitted this to Amy, but I, you know, my firm's always had LawPay. We it, the link goes out on our Clio bills, but I haven't sent it myself directly to clients as much 
as I have the last year. I've, I've sent it by email. You can text a link. It is so easy to get that out in, in clients. It makes it easier for them to pay you too. Because I think clients have good intentions. And we've talked about that, Amy. They have good intentions. They want to pay you. But if you mail a paper bill all too often, what happens? It ends oh, up getting buried on the kitchen counter. I mean, can you relate to that, Amy? Oh, I am not the tidiest lady in the world. And so I, my form of clutter, it takes, this, it takes the form of stacks right? So it's not clutter everywhere. It's stacks. So there's the, 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 the dresser stack and the kitchen Island stack and the table stack. But that what's really insidious about that is it turns a very well-intentioned lady into a late bill payer. So I know I've shared this story before I, I had to visit an urgent care, uh, not that long ago. And there was like a $20 remnant on my bill, right? I'm, I'm good for $20. Like I've got it. I want to pay it. I want to get that to do checked off my list, but the urgent care sent me a paper invoice for it. And I could only remit, remit payment through a check. I didn't know where my checkbook was at the minute I got the invoice. And I was like, Oh, I need to get to this, but you know, dogs are jumping and there's dinner to cook. So I set the invoice on the counter. And then before you know it, I set something on top of that. I start building one of my lovely little stacks and I, I have every intention of paying that bill. And it just slips from my mind until I get a, a, a letter like three months later being like, hey, you're over 120 days late on this payment. And again, very well-intentioned. I wanted to pay that bill. And if they had made it easy for me to do it, I would have done it immediately. Um, but cut to me, the girl who works in payments being three months overdue on a bill. Um, and it's the same with your clients. Your clients, most of them really do want to pay you. They're not trying to dodge a bill. They're not trying to escape their obligation, but you just have to make it easy for them. And you've got to meet them where they're at and in a manner that they're accustomed to. And these days that's online. And that's like Kristen said, as easy as a link in an email that you can click or a text on your phone, you can push to pay. That's how people are paying for their city utilities these days. So meet them on their terms and you'll find that they turn that payment around really quickly. Here we see at LawPay, if you give clients an option to pay online, 62% of payments get paid the same or of uh, bills get paid the same day because it's just easy and people want to get that off their list. Amazing. 62% the same day. So same day. I know you've got a ton of resources and data on payments and what's working for other firms and attorneys. So um, I'm hoping maybe you can drop a link for some of those resources in the chat. If people want Absolutely. To Is there anything you want to know on the video? No, I just think, you know, set up a set up a, a schedule that works for you. Find ways to build payments into your existing workflow. Um, you don't need to adopt a whole new routine. You don't need to upend your, your workflow. Um, with something as simple as law pay, it just plugs right in. So I'll drop some resources in the chat. Um, but yeah, find out how you can leverage technology to, to take something to do off your plate and make the payments part of your business way easier. I love that. I'm a big proponent. I talk all the time about, you know, whatever your pain point is in your business, because your law firm is your business, whatever it is, there's almost always either a tech solution or a human power solution. You just got to figure it out and give it a try. So I love that. Thank you. All Thank right, you. everyone. We are rounding third base towards home towards the end of this program. So now's the time. If you have questions, please start dropping them in the chat. We want to address your questions today. Um, but before we do that, it's my turn. <laughs> So I'm going to try to kind of do an overarching theme to this with something that we're seeing at legal, uh, through in legal, both at my law firm and in the work we're doing at Law Clerk. And that's the fact that I think that a lot of attorneys over the last year have taken advantage of these unique curveballs that the pandemic has presented to reevaluate a lot of things and to find ways to do law better. And for a lot of attorneys, that's meant finally taking a leap to try out a different business model, a different uh, billing system, whatever it has been, is they've you know, taken those leaps, tried new things, and all too often they're finding that they really enjoy these new ways of practicing law. They enjoy um, the new tools that are trying out. So what is one of the biggest reasons why lawyers are trying out new billing models, new working systems? Well, one of the biggest reasons I think is because clients are demanding it. Clients want more certainty. Now, we certainly cannot give our clients guaranteed outcomes when it comes to litigation or immigration cases or family cases or whatever. We can't give them a you know, certified guarantee. Uh, that's just not possible. But there's a lot of ways that we can give them certainty in knowing that we're going to be responsive when they reach out, in knowing that 
um, they can easily pay our bill when we send it to them. And knowing that they have access to their client portal and our practice management system to get updates and, and review documents they want, they want to see them. But I think they also want it in terms of knowing what they're going to spend. That's one of the biggest things that holds a person back from engaging an attorney and getting the legal help that they need is they don't like the hourly billing model of this, you know, endless abyss of legal fees and what's that going to cost. They want more certainty. Um, and if you don't believe me, I have a little bit of data to back that up. So if you access my slides, or if you look at the Clio Trends Report, I actually borrowed this from Clio, but my slide 80 is a chart from the Legal Trends Report last year that looks at different factors about what makes a lawyer hireable according to customers. And you know, some of the factors that make a lawyer, a lawyer more hireable than others are offering things like payment plans, fixed fees, flat fees, um, unbundled services, and subscription-based billing services. And so maybe you know, these are things that a lot of lawyers haven't considered in terms of their own business before. But again, through the course of the pandemic, they started to. So um, one of the things, I wanted to look at a couple of these different billing models, especially, and then they turn into staffing model considerations, which over hand in hand go towards law firm business models. So when we're looking at alternative billing models, of course, you have a flat fee. And that's something that a lot of some practices have used for years. You know, most commonly, um, I use that a lot in my estate planning practice. I, I offer certain types of estate planning work at flat fees. And clients like it because they know exactly what they're going to pay and exactly what they're going to get. Um, we also see this a lot in terms of immigration practices. It can be a very popular model there to do work for clients on a flat fee. Another alternative fee model that we're seeing more and more is some sort of a hybrid minimum fee where you charge a flat fee for a certain uh, segment of the work. And if you have a success in resolving the case before you've reached a certain threshold of number of hours worked or other factors, then that's all they pay is that minimum fee. But then you also have the option to convert to an hourly billing model if the case does, for whatever reason, proceed to lengthy litigation. So, you know, this hybrid mix of a flat fee with hourly on the minimum fee type billing is a great tool to offer. I see attorneys offering that in um, cases like DUI defense, criminal defense, et cetera, where they're sometimes able to negotiate and resolve really favorable outcomes for a client um, pretty quickly. But if not, you go into the litigation, then you're on an hourly basis. Now, another one that I've learned a lot about over the last few months is the option of offering unbundled legal services. And now uh, I had a misperception about unbundled services before I learned some more about them that they must, it must really be hard to make a living for attorneys doing that. If you've got a little piece by piece at a time, how do you possibly make a living doing that? Uh, but I was wrong. There's a lot of attorneys drowning in work that they get through these unbundled uh, working relationships because again, it's exactly what clients want. They want to work with someone for a certain segment of a case. They want that certainty. You're going to handle this for me. And then I'm going to go back to the little DIY that I've been doing for whatever reason. You know, another reason they like that is because most often these unbundled working relationships are done on a flat fee. So that works well for the client as well. Again, seeing a lot of unbundled, especially in the area of family law, but it really could be applied in a lot of different practice areas. And last but not least, subscription-based services. I mean, everybody on this call probably has a subscription, raise your hand, right? Like a food delivery service, or uh, you know, my, my dog gets the bark box every month of the treats and the toy. You know, we all have some sort of a subscription-based service that a lot of us love for whatever reasons. Maybe that's something that your clients would love too. Again, it's going to know, it's going to give them certainty that they have access to you for a certain amount of health every month, and they're going to pay a certain fee. They can budget that in, and it really works well. Clients like it. I'm seeing this in a lot of practice areas. Uh, attorneys that are working with nonprofit clients, uh, attorneys working with online creatives, um, people working with small businesses, even with larger businesses. It can be a win win for both the attorney and the client. And so I definitely want to uh, highlight that. Now, the flip side to all of this is that when you take the plunge to start trying some of these different billing models within your business model, that it can oftentimes lead to rapid growth. And then you have the uh, concurrent challenge of trying to manage that growth and how on earth do you get all this work done? And that's where there's a lot of other really cool options out there for lawyers and law firms that didn't really exist a few years ago. Um, I like to tell people, 
whatever type of help you need in a law firm, whether it's a marketing manager, it's a someone to answer the phone, it's someone to do, you know, a CFO to do your bills, it's a paralegal, it's a attorney, there are virtual outsourced resources for all of these roles. And so whenever you are trying to manage growth and trying to figure out the best staffing options for your own firm, it's important to, yes, consider those traditional hiring options that have brought law firms a lot of success for a lot of years, but also challenge yourself to consider virtual outsource options as well. There can be a lot of benefits to those modern staffing options in the fact that you can get exactly the amount of help and the exact kind of the type of help you need without paying for someone to maybe, you know, twiddle their thumbs for 10 hours of the week. Um, you can, you can get, you know, 20 hours a week, 30 hours a week, whatever you need, you can customize it. And I don't know about my other panelists, but I often find when I outsource work like that, I'm able to outsource it to someone who has a tremendous amount of experience. They are, you know, especially in terms of freelance lawyers, we find a law clerk that on average, our freelance lawyers are at least 11.6 years out of school. So these are not newbies. These are seasoned attorneys. They know how to take some pretty minimal instruction on a case and run with it. And that goes across the board for experienced freelancers and whatever type of help you need, you often are going to get a really high talent level of people that can work independently and run with it. Plus, you're going to keep your overhead low. You're not paying benefits. You're not paying for office space if you're working in an office again. You're not paying for a lot of those things that add up very quickly uh, when you are working in that outsourced capacity. So definitely want to challenge you to rethink your billing models, rethink your staffing models in your overall business firm. But the flip side, and I would be remiss not to mention this, is just if, if you've ever been one of those attorneys sitting there daydreaming about, gosh, I wonder if I could be a freelance lawyer and I could work from the beach or I could travel and I could work and, you know, I want to get an RV and travel the country or whatever, whatever that daydream is, if you've ever daydreamed about becoming a freelance lawyer and just doing the research and the writing and helping other lawyers and not managing clients, not going to court, there seriously has never been a better time to launch a career as a freelance lawyer. There's huge demand, uh, really interesting work uh, all over the U.S. and all different practice areas. And so definitely anyone out there who is curious about learning more about starting their own freelance career, connect with us at Law Clerk, and we have a bunch of resources for you there as well. So we are coming up right on an hour and I would love to go around the panel one more time and maybe if everyone wants to share a parting thought and then I also will um, scan to see if we have a question coming in or if someone saw a question coming they want to jump out let me know so um fantastic I think we're all okay. set on the questions um fantastic. but yeah let's do parting thoughts we've got two minutes mark go for it Eric. you've got the hot seat all right. Um, so I, I think I, I want to um, leverage, you know, like thinking about every, what everybody talked about and how Kristen, how you walked us through this. Um, one thing I always try to recommend is, you know, put the client in the middle of all this process. And with the marketing hat on, though, think about how you're helping that client and pr providing a better service along the way. And just don't forget to brag about it. That's all. All right. Uh, let's say uh, Rio. Yeah, so I would say I just to echo what you mentioned earlier, Maddie, ask, ask questions. <laughs> if you're not sure and you want to try something new, go ahead and ask. There'll be lots of people out there to help you. <laughs> awesome. Amy? Uh, kind of in the same vein as what Mark said, think about your client first and make things easy. Make things easy for them to drive action. If you want them to get back to you, give them a lot of opportunities and different ways to contact you. If you want them to pay, put the ball in their court. Um, so make it easy on your client and, and they will thank you for it. All right, Kristen, and then I'll, I'll close this out. Sounds great. So my parting thought would be, um, if you've been, you know, thinking on something, a different tool in your law firm that you want to try, whatever it may be, uh, hiring a virtual receptionist, starting a new practice management system, whatever, go for it. Um, most of these tools and resources out there offer some sort of a limited trial, oftentimes on a free basis. And one of the best things about being a solo or a small firm attorney, which I'm going to guess the majority of our audience today falls into that category, is that you can fail fast. So you, you have the freedom to try things out quickly without having to run it up to the executive committee at the big firm. You know, you can try it out, uh, but give it a good try. Give it a solid go for several months and then decide if it works for you or not. If not, shift gears and try something else. That's one of the best parts of being a solo or being part of a smaller firm. Those are such great tips. Thank you, everyone. And, and my last one would just be, you know, 
tackle the, the sort of starting point and not the entire project when you are testing, when you're experimenting, when you're reaching out. Sure, you can send Rio your whole sort of onslaught of questions, but she might respond and any of us might respond with, pick the three that are most important to you or pick that email that's going to be the first email in your marketing drip. Pick the site you're going to respond to your reviews on as, as a first step in the right direction. And instead of not getting started at all because the project seems so substantial, so time consuming, so sort of paralyzing, um, instead just start really small and you'll be amazed that simply getting a case management system, simply getting online payments, simply getting your account to actually hire that first freelancer, getting your first marketing campaign up and running, having sort of the awareness and the analytics there set up before you get into anything complicated, forwarding your calls to receptionist, adding chat to your site. These are all things that are really incremental, small, and hugely impactful. And then you can go into the deeper iterations and integrations and lean in. Um, but really chipping away at it from the very first sort of uh, bite-sized uh, uh, parts of that work is really the, the biggest way to um, understand how much time it's going to take on an ongoing basis and what is worth your time. You'll never know if you don't start small. So I hope this has been a really valuable session. Thank you for everyone who's already put in comments uh, in, the, in the chat. Uh, you will receive all the resources that we shared with you here today and more. And I just want to say thank you to our panelists and a special thank you to Kristen for being our moderator and guest host today. Thank you, Bonnie. Right, take care. Thank you all the attendees. Awesome. Thank Have you so much, everyone. Bye. Bye.